Okay, folks, uh, once again, welcome to our last session here in this room, anyway, for WP Campus. Uh, again, on behalf of Canisius College, welcome to Canisius College. Uh, our speaker right now is Donna Tallarico. She's a writer, content marketing consultant, and former director of communications in higher ed from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. She's been published in Cases Currents Magazine, The Guardian Higher Ed, and Wiley's Recruiting and Retaining Adult Learners newsletter. She's the founder and publisher of Hippo Campus Magazine, I love that. An <laughs> online literary <laughs> journal with a small press division. She's had past lives in radio, print media, and e-commerce. Nice thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Yeah. And thank you so much for being here. I know it's the last session of the day and um, there's other sessions. And so this session is not necessarily WordPress specific, but whatever platform you're working on, you need good content to fill it. So that's what we're going to talk about today. The mantra of this presentation is true stories with heart. So we're creating content for various places, multimedia formats, you know, we, we write, we edit, we produce, um, you know, on all different formats, but when it comes down to it, we need good raw material. So I often hear, you know, new writers or if you have interns in your department that are um, tasked with interviewing people, sometimes you might hear them say, I'm looking for a few quotes. Well, no, you're not. You're actually, you're looking for stories. That's what you're looking for. You're looking for people to communicate their story to you. So part of storytelling, and I presented on storytelling here last year, and Dwayne's session this morning was about storytelling, so we could talk a lot about storytelling, but I thought I would just give a reminder of what makes a good story. If you ever, has anybody here ever taken a creative writing class? Okay, so you probably had the show, don't tell, drilled into you. Um, so what does show, don't tell mean? It means, you know, not just exposition, not this happened, that happened, not just regurgitating the facts. So showing means in your stories, you want to build some scene. You want to have action and dialogue. You want the people in your stories to be doing things, to be saying things. You also want to include sensory detail. So that's things like sight, sound, smells, texture. I'm a real big texture person. You know, um, all of that. Taste also. Um, so your story should have sensory detail. And then showing also means what's not said. You know, reading between the lines. Um, what, what isn't being said. You know, and again, that can kind of go along with action because somebody might be saying or doing something and the actions sometimes speak louder than words, as you know. So it all starts here. We can tell better stories and show those sensory details if we interview better. So who we ask matters, what we ask matters, how we ask it, when we ask it, and even where we ask it. It all contributes to our stories being better. So why do we interview people? You know, again, we are creating a lot of content in higher education, and a lot of that content benefits from solid interviews. No, not everything. You know, there are some things that you just, you know, that you just need to write. You don't need to talk to anybody. But what we're talking about today is the content that does require interviews. And all of these types of content, you know, whether you're writing a feature story for your alumni magazine, or if you're doing a video testimonial, or maybe a documentary style video, even blog posts, all of these can have storytelling element, elements in it. So think about what else. Think about the content that you create or your department or team creates. It probably involves some type of storytelling. <laughs> and when you're telling stories, you want your content to come alive. You want your characters to come alive. So don't make your subjects sound like robots, unless they are. <laughs> That'd be cool, and we're probably not far from that. But so you want to do good interviews so your stories and subjects can come alive. So part one is all about preparing for the interview. You know, how do you get your subject ready? How do you get yourself ready? So a clue to that is you, you need to get out your shovels, you know, because you're going to do some digging. You're going to do some deep digging. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, those are kind of scary shovels. <laughs> but we're digging for a good purpose, okay. not to bury something. <laughs> That's another presentation. Okay. That'll be next year. Yes, okay. yes. How to bury that story you shouldn't have told. 
<laughs> so come with me, go down to Washington. There's a lot of people who like that. Yes. <laughs> so the type of story that you're working toward is going to dictate the type of questions or even the type and tone of interview that you're doing. So again, uh, you know, someone in the audience just mentioned Washington. So you know, if you're a political journalist or an investigative reporter, you're probably going to use different tactics than you would if you're writing you know, a happy marketing piece. Um, so for the most part in higher ed, we're not dealing with breaking news, but you never know. I mean, something, there could be a, a cool story that happens in, in the news and you want to do something really quickly on your website. So that might dictate a different way. You might just pick up the phone and have to call somebody immediately versus doing an interview in person. So we'll have a little bit more on that later. But a good interview starts with good research. You know, so before you even um, show up for your interview, you want to do your research on the topic, on the subject. You want to see what else was written about that topic, because you might have an angle in mind. But through your research, you might find a new angle. You know, maybe what you want to talk about, maybe this person or that topic has already, it's, it's kind of tired and you didn't know it at first, because we've all had that. We've all had that great business idea, and then we go to buy the domain name, and oh, somebody's already doing it. <laughs> so do some research and find out if there is another angle, or you know, if the angle here is, um, that you already approached is OK. And go beyond Google. You know, If you're writing about an alumnus of your institution that maybe graduated in the 40s or 50s, go to the archives of your library and maybe look up the 1954 view book so you can get an idea or not view book a yearbook and see what people were doing on campus at that time you know you could get some gold for for your stories to to go back and those are things that you know not everything interesting is online so depending on your subject you might want to go offline to do some of your research exactly um and <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, um, so research can also help boost your confidence as an interviewer because you're going to walk in more prepared. It's going to boost your credibility because you're going to ask better questions, and that's going to build a little more respect between you and, and the interviewer. You know, because sometimes we you know some people can be difficult to interview. So, do some research ahead of time. And then you also want to find a suitable location and also suit up as the situation calls. So you want to make sure your subject is comfortable. Um, you know, are you going to invite them to your office or do you need to meet them somewhere that might be more comfortable for them, like maybe in their house? You see this all the time in um, some big profile pieces on you know, important personalities where the reporter tags along with them for the day or might spend some time at their home to do some other things. So figure out where the best you know, where the best material is going to come from, because the subject's comfort will dictate that. And also suit up as the situation calls. You want to be professional, but you also want to be comfortable. Um, so you want to make a good impression, but, um, you know, so here they're sitting on a bench with some, I think it's water, but I'd like to think it was, sure it's wine. wine. Yeah, yeah. She is really relaxed. She is going to really open up. <laughs> good question. And, and don't be afraid to go the distance for a story, geographically or metaphorically. Um, just, I put this picture here because my husband and I, we went to a conference in Minneapolis. It was a writing conference, and we decided not to stop at Minneapolis. We just kept going to Fargo just so we could take this picture with the wood chipper. So it was like four hours out of the way, four hours back. We actually ended up staying the night, but you know, it was, that was the only reason. And we did this, so one, it was fun, it was an adventure, but now we have a great story to tell because we went the distance. Now, that's not for a story that we wrote or was published anywhere, but I just use that as an illustration that what could make your story interesting? You know, what else can you do to just ramp up that idea just to take it to the next level? So don't be afraid to go along for the ride, do a taste test, participate in something. You know, if you're interviewing an alum because they just opened up a microbrewery or a cool, like, soda company, go and taste it. You know, you might not be injecting yourself into the story, but you'll still get better background and have a better idea of what to do. So don't be afraid to take it to the next level. And then there are some other options with um, like where to do your interviews and how to do your interviews, such as the telephone. We'll get into that later. But most of what I want, um, most of what I'm talking about today, I want you to imagine that it's for an in-person interview and it's some, for something more featurey. So kind of going back to preparing for the interview, building research. The moment you reach out to your subject or subjects for the first time, you start building trust. You start building a rapport with them. So that just, you know, it's not just during the interview, but it's how you approach them and how you value their, their time. 
Um, and you also want to set expectations, you know, let them know ahead of time what the intent of the article is for, what the story's for, where it's going to go. If it's a magazine article and you also publish your magazine online, you might want to let them know it's going to be out there on the internet as well, because not everybody puts two and two together that it's for the magazine, but oh, it's also going to live online indefinitely. So just prepare the subject. And of course, things can change, you know, once you get your material and you might want to do something bigger with the story, but try to communicate with them as best you can what to expect. This is, this is also another place for interview goal. When you arrive to meet with your subject, you know, observe them. Observe your surroundings. Look on the walls. Look on the bookshelves. Look on their desk. If you're in their home, how are they interacting with their family members, with their children? If they're at the office, you know, are they just hanging up the phone because they're really busy? You know, how are they interacting with their employees? You know, just really pay attention to everything because you can pick up things that maybe you didn't find in your research. You can jot down new questions to ask. Maybe a whole new angle or hook of the story will come out just by you taking in your, your surroundings and situation once you get there. Maybe they collect something, you know, really interesting, you know, or maybe, you know, they have the Twilight Trilogy up there and you would never have expected them to have a guilty pleasure of reading, you know, YA, you know, sci-fi stuff. So, you know, see what you can learn. And then you can use the research you did ahead of time, but also the observational things that you did when you first got there to break the ice a little bit, to continue building trust, to continue building that relationship. So break the ice. It's cool. I like puns. <laughs> um, so then, you know, as you're developing your questions, um, you know, anybody who's trained in journalism or really anybody knows what the questions are. You have the five, y, five W's and the Y, or and the how. So for news stories, again, that's more straightforward. That's about the who, what, when, when, and where. But if you're writing a feature story, and a lot of the writing that we do in higher ed is to be emotional because people make decisions based on emotion. You know, what school am I going to attend? Am I going to give back to my alma mater? You know, so you want to get into the emotion of it, and that's where the why and the how questions come in. So, of course, the W's, you know, the who and the what are important to all stories, but you really want to focus on the why and the how when you're doing a human interest story. And then um, I want to challenge you to not prepare your questions. I mean, you should prepare your questions, or maybe you don't want to, because there's this divide of if you should show up with a formal list of questions or just a bulleted list of topics that you might want to talk about, just some keywords that you want to hit and then see where the conversation goes. I'm a fan of that method, just to kind of plan for spontaneity and flexibility because you don't know how the day's going to go, how the subject's going to feel, but you definitely want to have, you know, some planning. And you also probably don't want to give your subjects the questions ahead of time because that will get them, you know, planning in advance for what to say, or it doesn't allow for flexibility because if you show up and then you want to change gears, there's, well, that's not what you said you were going to ask me, you know, so now you just kind of broke some trust there. Um, so try not to do that. But having a list of questions could be good to get you back on track if you, if, you know, if you lose your place. But don't get so tied to that list of questions that you're not paying attention because you're, you're looking at your list. So questions really are going to be the meat of, of the interview. Obviously, that's kind of what the interview is, questions and answers. But don't ask yes or no questions unless you need to get them back on track and get them to you know, change gears because then that's a really good way to take control back to ask a yes or no question. But try to ask open-ended questions and try to ask specific questions. But also don't be afraid to not ask a question. Maybe tell them to tell you a story. Tell you about the time, you know, tell me about the time you did this or that. Get them talking and try to get them to reveal more anecdotes. You know, so if you notice that they're just giving like short, uninteresting, bland questions, try to get them to tell you some stories. And be sure to ask follow-up questions, especially if, you know, I was listening on the way here. Um, it was just a radio interview and somebody said, do you think that will save money? Or how do you think that will save money? And he goes, oh, well, we'll get more bang for the buck. Okay, move on to the next question. Well, no, you just kind of said what I said. So how are you going to get more bang for the buck? So ask those follow-up questions. 
you know, it might make the subject a little uncomfortable, but you have to remember that the reader is going to be reading this. You know, they don't care about that feeling in that moment where you're afraid to probe a little more. So ask probing questions, repeat your questions or rephrase the questions to, you know, get them to open up a little bit more. So remember the shovels, open-ended questions, follow-up questions, probing questions, you know, that's all how, you know, that's going to increase the quality of your material. So shovels. You don't want to be confusing though. How many times have you heard, I like to ask you a question, but it has three parts. By the time you get to three, <laughs> the, the subject has already forgot. You know, so like this merry-go-round, this picture, their mind is just going to be spinning. They don't know what to answer first, and then you're going to get frustrated because you're like, you didn't answer my question, but they already forgot about it because our working memory, you know, we only have so much to go with. So try to ask just one question at a time. And a lot of times for those two or three part questions, they might actually answer the next part anyway without you having to answer it since it's, since it's related. And then you want to listen carefully. Sorry, I had to take a swig there. And just ever since that thing happened with Ted Cruz, I'm always afraid to take a drink while I'm at the podium, but <laughs> sometimes you just have to. <laughs> so you want to listen. But not just listen, you want to listen carefully, you know, because you're going to pick up on cues. Um, you know, you're going to just, like I said, if you were uh, going to a list of formal questions, you might not be listening because you're so focused on what you're going to ask next that you miss something. Um, John Fain, he's a broadcast journalist, so this is talking about, you know, being on camera or, or on tape, but you know, he doesn't want to get stuck in the position where he's talking to somebody and he's not concentrating. And then his listeners are saying, why didn't you ask this? So for him, concentrating is really important. So just don't just listen. And you might be recording the conversation and say, oh, I can listen to it later. No, you need to listen there in that moment. And acknowledge. This was supposed to be a GIF, but it Download it as a video instead. So, but you want to acknowledge, you know, head nodding. I mean, I saw myself on camera a couple times in interviews, and all I do is nod my head up and down, and I get like I make myself dizzy. But at least I'm acknowledging that I'm listening, you know. And this goes back to setting expectations. But if you're taking notes, you might be looking down at your notebook. That could appear that you're not interested in what they have to say. So you might even want to say ahead of time, hey, if I'm looking down, it's not because I'm not listening. I'm writing down notes. So that kind of sets that expectation of what, what will happen. So acknowledge. Um, you know, if you notice that your subject is uncomfortable, if you're paying attention to their body language, you can adjust how you're asking the questions as well. And going along with questions, you want to ask clarifying questions and reorienting questions. Because we're in higher ed and we're interviewing people that have a lot to say about their topic. <laughs> um, so sometimes you might need to reel them in a little bit. Or maybe they're speaking in, in jargon, you know, if they're in the sciences or, you know, military background, you know, anything with lots of ranks and things, um, the end reader might not know what those mean. So you might want to say, hey, um, can you say that in layman's terms? Or, hey, if you were explaining this to a 10-year-old, how would you explain it? Um, so try to get them to, you know, don't be afraid to pretend that you don't know what they're talking about um, because you need to get it more accurate. If something's really complex and you, you're not getting it in the interview, that might not translate to your, your readers either. So get them to restate things. And, uh, and then, the reorienting questions, you know, again, they could just go off on tangents, so you want to keep them on track. And those could also be re, re, reorienting statements, like, hey, well, can we get back to what we were talking about before? Or that might be, you know, a yes or no question. So what you're saying is, yes, great, and then move on. You also want to be quiet. You know, again, actions can sometimes speak louder than words. And I think sometimes silence makes us uncomfortable. So when nobody's talking, we're like, okay, we need to get in there with the next question. But that can be a big part of your story. You know, as somebody kind of leaning in, but then they, they lean back to re reflect, or they look up at a picture on the wall, or, you know, they start to kind of tear up a little bit. You know, pay attention. You know, that nonverbal stuff can be really important. And we all have that friend or family member that's very quiet, and they don't talk a lot, but when they say something, it's a zinger. You know, so 
let them be quiet, let them think about something, you know, don't ruin that moment, don't ruin their thought process. And this goes along with, um, you know, body language. It can also confirm the validity of the answers. Again, you know, in higher ed, we're not interviewing people to try and get them, you know, to catch them in a lie or anything like that. But, you know, if, if you're trying to read your subject and how they're doing on, on the interview, you know, that nonverbal stuff can really come in handy. You also want to be humble in the interview. You know, we're all experts in what we do, and whoever we're interviewing, you're interviewing them because they're an expert in something or they did something fabulous, something newsworthy, something inspirational. You don't want to jut in with the, oh, that happened to me once, or, well, when I did that, or, you know, I used to do this. It, then it kind of makes it about you, and you don't want that. You're interviewing them for a certain reason. So even if you know more about a topic than the person you're interviewing, or you have a wealth of experience, if you're interviewing somebody that's, you know, a, a colleague of yours, you still don't want to talk over them. And, you know, and during the icebreaking phase, you might share some of those commonalities. But, you know, when you get into the interview, you don't want to lead every question with a story about yourself. And also, I kind of said this before with not coming with a complete list of formal questions, but be open. Be spontaneous and be surprised. You never know what's going to come out of the interview. Um, so just be open to that and open to changing your, your story. And coach if you need to. I miss that TV show. <laughs> um, it's okay to give guidance during the interview and reaffirm, you know, the, the needs that you have, the value that they're going to bring to the piece in the view book or to the campaign piece, you know, remind them of why you're interviewing them. And leading questions might be necessary, and I don't mean leading questions in the points where you want to put words in their mouth, but maybe you can say, you know, a little while ago, you were really passionate when we were talking about this topic. You know, if you could share something similar or kind of going along with the story you said before and just kind of remind them to keep talking. So, um, so you don't want to like definitely say, so what you're saying is this, this, and this, and then write that down as their quote. Still try and get them to say it. But wait. The interview is not just about your subject. It's about preparing your, yourself mentally and physically. You have a job to do. And when you show up, you know, we, a lot in higher ed or whatever industry we're in, we probably wear a lot of hats. We might not have a lot of time to tell this story or to do the interview. Um, we might be frazzled and stressed, but we can't show up to the interview because if we're in a certain mindset, it could either show through, it could affect the quality, of the work we do, we might just wanna rush through something. So make sure you eat before your interview. Um, you know, if you have a difficult subject and you're not getting the answers you want and you didn't have your Snickers bar, <laughs> you're gonna be hangry and you're gonna get frustrated. So try to make yourself as relaxed and refreshed and you know, stay hydrated um, and be rehearsed and ready. You know, if your interview is going to be, um, if you're gonna be heard on the interview, you know, if, it's, if you're part of the interview, you might want to be rehearsed. You might want to do some voice exercises. You might want to do something to get, you know, physically in the mood. So don't forget to take care of yourself. And you want to have the right tools too. I think I need to move this up a little bit. Um, pack what you need, but pack what you don't need. I have um, a, a heavy rain, I might go camping after this, and I brought a tent, a sleeping bag, a lantern, a raincoat, and all this stuff in my trunk. I might not even use it, but I want to be ready in case I pass like a campground on my way home that I have never been to before. So pack what you don't need. Um, this happened to me last week, so I added it to my slides. Get your subject's phone number. Because if you're running late or something, you might say, oh, I'll just email them. I'll Facebook message them. I will text them. If your subject is driving to meet you, do you really want to risk them getting into a car accident because their phone buzzes and they have to text you back? So a phone call could be good. Um, and the reason I added this is I had to meet somebody, it wasn't for an interview, but we were meeting at a place on Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock. I forgot that I live in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, where things are closed or close early on Sunday. He didn't pick up on it either, so our meeting spot was closed, and I did not have his phone number. So I just had to wait, wait for him to pay to park to come meet me and say, we can't meet here, we have to go somewhere else. If I would have had his phone number, we could have just met somewhere else. Bring a notebook and pen or pens, because pens run out. Um, this morning, I realized I didn't have enough pages in my notebook, so I was sitting next to Jesse, and I joked that 
my presentation later, I'm telling people they need to be prepared and I only have two pages left in my notebook, but I have two pens with me. So you never know. Um, and then have a voice recorder. You wanna take notes and record the interview if, if possible. You could use a traditional recorder or a phone app. Um, there's a lot of them to use. But with your phone app, you know, use caution with that. You might be interviewing somebody where you don't have the best reception, or maybe you forgot to turn off your location services, the interview's going really well, your battery's drained, you're sitting on their back porch and you can't plug in your phone. Now you have to say, excuse me, sir, I know you're really comfortable out here in your yard, but can we go inside so we can, so I can plug this in an outlet? You work so hard to make the person feel comfortable and now you're making it about yourself and you want to move the interview because you need power. Now a regular digital recorder can also run out of juice, but, but you get what I mean. So you want to um, have the most reliable thing that you can. And you might want to look into transcription software, maybe even hiring a freelance transcriber. Part of this is about making sure things are accurate, but transcribing, especially a long conversation, can take a long time. And we have limited resources, but I know some transcribers out there that charge by the, a dollar an audio minute, so that's not that much of an investment to pay somebody $60 to transcribe an hour-long interview or something like that. Um, you know, in this day, we might have to save our records, our, our notes. So you might want to annotate your documents, come up with some naming convention filing system um, and with your backup so you can find things later. And when I was searching for pictures on Flickr Creative Commons, I found this. This is a designer, but she lived in Hong Kong during typhoon season. Don't discount that if you're walking to meet somebody that it couldn't, couldn't rain. So maybe you want to put your reporting tools in, you know, in a bag. I mean, this is being ultra prepared, but she even um, said that she had little bags of silica gel in there so her mole skin didn't get too moist. And then she had candy, those little gel candies in there as well. But so that's, she's more of a designer, but I just thought that would be fun to put in there. Now, if you're coming to your meeting with a team, you know, you might have a photographer that's coming with you, a videographer. Make sure that your team is educated and aware that they, they can't be disruptive. They can't add to the discomfort. You know, sometimes people are really intimidated if there's other people in the room, you know, so play it by ear with what the subject is all about. Um, now, sometimes there could be a lot of crap happening in the, in the office and you have some coworkers together when they're out of the office and you can have a chance to vent. Don't do that in front of the subject. You know, it's not professional, so kind of hide any of those internal woes or, or tension and just be professionals. I see that happen all the time at restaurants. I'll hear people talking about this person. I'm like, you're, you're saying that right in front of your customers. You know, you don't want that to happen. And then, um, so most of what I said applies to any type of interview. Um, but if you are doing an on-camera interview, you know, you might want to have water on hand. People, you know, literally um, can't talk sometimes if they get parched. That, that's why I just took a sip of water. Um, start with the easier questions first. If it's um, on camera, to ease into it. And remind them that the interview isn't live. Well, unless it is, because we could do live interviews. But that way, it gets them talking a little more freely, and they could stop and start their answer over again if they mess up. So just let them know it's OK. And earlier, when I mentioned be quiet, the pause is really important online, too. Because even if you're doing a short minute and 30 second video clip, if somebody just pauses for a moment just to reflect and think, that emotion, their facial expression can go really far in, you know, in communicating something. So the power of the pause is important visually too. Um, and of course, you know, all the technology stuff that doesn't necessarily have to do with the interviews, but you know, make sure you're using the right equipment and don't forget to get some B-roll and maybe some natural sound. Um, and this can kind of go along with audio interviews too if you're doing some type of podcast. If you're doing a phone call, again, in-person interviews, I believe, are the best. But a phone call might be good if you just need some quick information. Somebody's across the miles. It's breaking news. But if you're using the phone because you need a quicker solution, you might want to limit the small talk and all that ice breaking. You just want to get, you know, get right to it. And I learned this when I did a telemarketing job in high school. Smile when you dial, you know? So if, even if you're not there, you want to let the person know that you're interested in talking to them and, you know, what they're saying matters. Um, and here it's a little harder to recognize the pause, but try not to talk over the person and maybe wait a little bit to be sure they're done talking. Video interviews. <laughs> 
kind of the same, you know, a lot of the same things, but the setting and the timing, like, I think basically what we learned this year is lock your door, you know, <laughs> um, cause this really spiraled into some things that are, would take up too much time to talk about, but the, the poor guy, but his daughter's adorable. Um, and you might be doing a video interview cause you're just taking notes, but if you are planning to actually air this the actual video again, the equipment and the technology you're using will matter a little more. But if you're just using it to have a conversation for a print story, then the technology doesn't matter as much. Okay, the reason I saved email interviews for last is because I wanted to show you the power of the in-person interview. You know, we talk about all the observation techniques, all the follow-up questions, all of this great stuff. But now there's this whole element of email interviews. Um, I, I went back to school as an adult learner and I was on the college newspaper stuff, but at the same time, I was a stringer feature writer for the local newspaper, but I found myself for the school newspaper sending emails to people. And I was like, oh, this is so easy and quick. But then for my, um, I stumbled upon this like ghost town called Stoddardsville and I interviewed this man and in his house, it was like a museum. And he lived alone. His wife had died like 20 years earlier, but he had uh, a puppy, oh, he had a dog. And so my whole story kind of changed because he wasn't a lonely old man. He had this companion and he lived in this museum. And, and I realized, oh my God, why am I emailing people? So way back, I actually had to go to the Wayback Machine to find this website that I wrote for, but I wrote an article in 2005 called Why I Deleted Email Interviews. Like I've had a love-hate relationship with them for a long time, but I don't call them interviews. I call them surveys. And in fact, um, disclaimer, I've done them. I have done them. I'm not proud of it, but sometimes you just get in a bind and you have to. But I do see some freelance journalists ask on Twitter, hey, can you help me with my story? Just fill out this Google form. How is that showcasing any of the skills that you have if you're just like, hey, fill out this form, okay, I'm, I'm done with that interview, now I can move on. So email interviews can also cause some sloppiness. Um, in the intro, you heard that I run a literary magazine and we run inter um, interviews sometimes. And our interview person, and I'm not trying to embarrass anybody, but this is, I took a screenshot of the Word document as it was sent to me. Um, line breaks, because they just copied and pasted from Gmail, and then not even fixing the spaces in between. It can make us sloppy. You know, are we a writer if we're just copying and pasting from Gmail? And then the other thing is, what, what do you call New York City when you say it out loud, if you're abbreviating? The city, New York. Do you ever say, hey, we went to NYC for the weekend? But that's how the interview ran, the book fair in NYC. The person lives in New York. She would never, ever say NYC out loud. But when you write it, NYC, it's quick and it's easy. So when people are answering your interview questions when they're typing, they're gonna have a completely different way of writing it because they're just gonna abbreviate, you know, and um, it's not how somebody would really talk. My local newspaper did a story about how the founder of a um, uh, department store, Peter Watt, got his name, and you can tell, and you'll pick up on this, now that I'm pointing it out, if you, haven't, if you don't notice this already, but she said, I have a pile of W and S stuff. Watt and Shand is three syllables. She would not say out loud, my, my dad worked at W and S, which is four syllables, and we don't talk in ampersands, we would say, you know what I mean? So again, lazy reporting, he just copied and pasted. So he, the writer didn't catch it, and the copy editor didn't, didn't catch it, but I caught it. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but think about it. I mean, again, if you have to do email interviews, think about the content you're getting and how can you clean it up so it actually sounds like a real interview. Here's another one. This, this was an email interview on um, McSweeney's or uh, another book website. People don't talk in bulleted lists or numeric lists. So again, um, I'm going to slide through these quick. This was another email interview with a bunch of editors. So that person maybe had a couple sentences, this person had a little, and this person, whoa, big block of text. So if I was the editor of this article, I probably would have shortened the other guys or set the expectation and said, you know, if you're doing an email interview, I'm going to probably keep the questions brief or I might edit for room or space. So you don't have to feel the need to put everything in there. Other issues with email. You know, veracity, who really wrote it? It's, you know, I don't want to sugarcoat it. It, 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 can, it can be lazy. You know, if it's a last resort, okay, but if you're just doing it because you want to, 
it's lazy. You lose control, you lose that emotion and nonverbals, and then you're giving your subject a chance to self-censor and self-edit. They might have your questions for days, and they might treat it like a school assignment, like I'm gonna work on this for, for a couple days, and I'm gonna send the best answers, I'm gonna send it around and have my family or my, my assistant look at it. No, I mean, that's, that loses everything. Um, and it's more time consuming than you think. You know, some people are like, oh, just send me the questions, but it takes more time to type up those things. Um, and again, you miss an opportunity for your skills to shine. And what I like to say about email interviews is if you're writing a human interest story and your goal is to evoke some kind of emotion, you want some kind of warmth in that story. So why would you use the coldest possible way to interview somebody? So just think about that. But if you must use, oh, here's two quotes too. I won't, I won't read them out loud, but basically the gist of it is if you're letting somebody else do it, you're a cipher, you're a secretary, you're just taking down a written presentation, a written, a written speech. So emailing, you know, kind of just like meetings, you know how, I mean, email is good for arranging meetings or arranging an interview, doing some fact checking and follow up. But if you must use email interviews, um, I did an email interview once where the person said, um, I'll send you one question at a time. That way it's more like a conversation. So that could be a strategy. Um, or I said this before with the other slide, but let them know that you might edit it. You can be conversational. You know, please keep your questions brief. Um, and then craft your story as if the answers were said aloud. Um, so I only have about 10 minutes left, so I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit. But you want to use your content, the fruits of your labor, to make the best story you can make. So maybe your angle changed, or did you change your, you know, did you find your angle or do you need to change it? One piece of advice that I was given once is to, after you do your interview, don't look at your notes. Don't do the transcription. Just write it, or at least write an outline. Because what you remember most from talking to your subject or subjects that could be what's most important and memorable about the story. So give it a shot. And then as you dig deeper into your, your draft, then you can you know, refer back to your notes. And maybe you'll uncover other source materials. If somebody keeps talking about a mentor they had in their life, maybe you could call that mentor too. Maybe you'll find new people to interview. And then we could do a whole session on content writing, but then you're gonna write your completely amazingly rich story. Um, Metatron there from Supernatural, I had to use him since he's big into stories. Then you have to decide if you want to share or not. Um, Michael Lennon, he's the biographer of Norman Mailer, and he works at my alma mater, but he does a lot of biographies, and he actually has people sign a release form before he interviews them. So they know, like, there's something in writing that says, yes, I can use what you said. Um, you know, but there's, it's taboo in journalism to let somebody see your source, you know, to read your story ahead of time. But there could be reasons that you have to do it, you know, for the sake of a biography, you know, you might want to for a quick news story, feature story, you might not. Um, but we know, we know politics. Sometimes, you know, the director of development might, might want to read the magazine article because it's about a donor. So do the best you can to keep things within your writing team, because I think if somebody else at your institution wants to see everything or approve everything, that's not your immediate supervisor or is not like on your content or creative team, there's probably other issues there that have to do with trust and are they doing their job right? But, you know, so I just, I just think it's important to not share things because then you could just miss deadlines and you go down rabbit holes and could change the whole direction if the source doesn't like what they see. So again, it goes back to building trust though. Your complete story should be okay. You know, if, you know, if you have to show them the story ahead of time because you're afraid they're not gonna like it, then you might question what's in there, you know, what didn't I do? So, uh, um, and also fact checking. Um, you're gonna fact check real time during the interview, but also while you're drafting and writing, during the revision, and then even during the proofing. Somebody taught me once to circle every number, every title, every name, because those are things that people, you know, especially the spelling of their name or their title, um, any numbers or facts, those are things that could just, with a typo, could trans, you know, pose things. Like, you could mix up complete decades by mixing up numbers. So, those are some things to look for for fact-checking. Fact um, but if you did your job well with the interview, with your preparation and resource, uh, research, you'll have, you know, a lower margin of error with your story. And then, getting it done and keeping it up. So, I think there comes a point 
in every session at a higher ed uh, conference, a session about content leads to this, but I don't have the time or the things to do my job. So, you know, there's human resources that, that we need. We need people and we need time. And I really think, and you might feel this way too, that writers or, you know, the idea of writing stories doesn't get enough attention at our institutions. You know, I used to have to shut my door and remind people that, you know, I'm writing. I need time to concentrate. I need time to just brainstorm and sit here and, and think about this story for a little while. So, you know, you might need to think roles and responsibilities. Um, consider investment in more staff or maybe hire contractors, you know, freelance writers. And, you know, a lot of alumni magazines already do that. Um, or invest in some content management tools that will make other things easier so you have more time to write and more time to interview, you know, to go out for a whole day, spend your day with the subject. But a lot of times we don't have that time to give up. And in order to do that, you know, usually the people on our immediate team believe in this and want those resources, but sometimes we need the buy-in. And, um, you know, ultimately stories need respect. Um, and just to breeze through, I mean, there's just, if you want to get better at interviewing, you know, watch award-winning interviews, listen to popular podcasts, Radio Lab is great, you know, just even for production value. And maybe even, and this might be a little weirder to do as an, as an adult and professional, but I remember in high school, I tagged along with a reporter. You know, maybe you can tag along with a veteran reporter and just see how they treat their subjects. Um, and then if you write, like if you have a science feed or if you write for a science magazine, just continue to develop your background knowledge. That's more applicable if you just write about the same topic. So the bottom line is, if you do better interviews, you're going to get better stories. And that's going to mean better content because maybe it's for one story, but then you're going to repurpose it in all of these places. And that's going to lead to better results. So that could be enrollment. That could be alumni engagement. That could be donors. Um, it could just be more interaction on social media. So if you're telling true stories with heart, you know, it's going to be great. Um, so that's the link to the survey. Well, obviously you can't click on that, but um, that's the survey number if you want to go right there. But any questions? I know I kind of went right up to the time limit here, but I'm happy to answer any questions or ask questions, answer questions later if you run out of time. And if you don't have questions, maybe, oh, okay. Um, and, you know, it's probably pretty subjective, but how do you deal with um, colloquialisms and unique speech things that you either need to add for, add more language for clarity or I mean, you try to leave it as raw as possible for the flavor? Or? Yeah. For those viewing the live stream, the question was about colloquialisms and other ways of speech. Do you leave them in or not for the flavor of the story? And I would say definitely. You know, I would um, maybe clear up some grammatical things if you know it was a mistake, but if it's a regional dialect or something that shows that person's personality, I would definitely do that. Um, I still, to this day, don't know what it means, but you see sick sometimes in brackets that says this is how the subject said it. So you could incorporate something like that. Um, if you think it's something that would, I mean, you probably don't want to put an editor's note saying we left this in here to reflect the flavor, but maybe in your lead or some other ways, you could show the reader why the language is that way. Like the person grew up or this person is from this country or, or in the indirect quotes. I kind of skipped over about indirect quotes versus quotes, but you could maybe just um, mention, you know, I'm trying to, I saw an example the other day, but it was the person said a word and then the reporter wrote, this word is a name for this and this language. So I definitely would try to leave it in for flavor. Right. Yeah. Any other questions? So I was thinking about the fact that um, we're not always necessarily telling a big story. It isn't necessary that we're procuring news. Yeah. Sometimes we're procuring testimonials. Mm -hmm. And I can see how you can apply this in a, in a smaller way to getting testimonials that aren't just, I think she's great, but getting a story out of why, you know, somebody has done well or the feedback that you're looking yeah. So do you think that there's ways that you can do that there too? Absolutely. Just doing yeah. Yeah. So the question was about um, get, using interviews for smaller things like a student testimonial. Um, I think, 
I, I would still maybe do an interview. Maybe you'd have to do it on the phone call, but instead of saying, hey, could you send me a testimonial about this? You could pick up the phone and say, tell me what you learned from this mentor. Or you said it was a great program and it helped you out, but could you elaborate, you know, how did you change? You know, um, you say you love living in Buffalo. It's a great city, but what does a great city mean? You know, how does it, you know, how has it changed you moving there? So I would ask some more probing questions and you could maybe help formulate that into a testimonial. And, um, and I should say something about the quotes and indirect quotes. You know, a lot of times you might just, anything that a subject says, you pull it into your story verbatim. But one thing to keep in mind is that if you, the writer, can say it, or any man on the street could say what that person said, that probably doesn't need to be a quote. You know, so if somebody says, I'm gonna graduate in 1998, you can just put the person's name in class in 98. So you'll get a better, more tight story too if you use most of what the interview interviewee says as background material and as filler content for your story and save the quotes for like those really important things that only they could say. Yeah. Um, have you checked out the, 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 uh, the Turnaround podcast? I have not. He asked if um, I checked out the Turnaround podcast. Is that about interviewing? It is. Oh, it is. awesome. It's, okay. It's a, it's a This American Life spinoff okay. podcast okay. where the, the host interviews Mark Marin and Audie Cornish and okay. Ira Glass about their interview techniques. I'm writing this down. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, for the live streamers at home, it's a Turnaround podcast and it's a spinoff of NPR's This American Life. And uh, they interview interviewers about their interviewing process. So awesome. Thank you for that. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And go enjoy Buffalo. Thank you. Thank you.